Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've made it. I'm actually in the office right now. Um, we, we went ahead and got an office for the channel. Going forward, we'll have more space to work on things. Specifically, I wanted to work more on TechWave, an area for podcasts and kind of like talk shows and everything. And there's a lot of stuff now that I have plans for going forward. Pretty awesome to see. We will have, I'll do some sort of like office tour in the in the future or something so you guys can see it. But for now, I have kind of an area set up uh, at my desk here that we can do some recording for different things as well. And Newswave, of course, will go forward like normal. And hopefully TechWave will be back in full force in the next uh, week or so. And that, that's exciting because I have quite a few things piled up to do, but today I actually wanted to talk a bit about some games that I've played in 2020 so far, actually five of them, some of the best ones and the worst ones, and some of the ones in between. I do have one that I guess I would consider the worst one. You might be wondering why I, I played it in 2020. Well, to be honest, 2020 has been kind of boring. There, there's not a lot going on in 2020 so far, and most people are saying look to your backlog, and also look towards some smaller games and others uh, that were kind of out there, but figure we talk about that today so if you enjoy the video guys make sure to hit the like button on the way out to help out uh the video with the search algorithm with google and all that anyway let's let's start with a game that i had a lot of fun with actually it's a closed beta it was fantasy star online 2 and i think some of you actually got a chance to play it as well because we were talking on twitter when the first night nothing was happening because everyone tried to hit that server at the same time and sega was not ready for it at all they started one ship and everyone was trying to bust into it, and it just, it did not work. It was pretty bad. It was it was ugly, I would say, for Phantom Star Online 2, but they managed to reset servers, managed to pull up more ships that we could all play on, and eventually it ran smooth. No real issues at all, and at that point, I was really excited. This is a game that released back in 2012 in Japan, and it's been on multiple systems. It's even been on the Vita. Yeah, the PlayStation Vita. It's been on there, and there have been talks about bringing it to other platforms in the West as well, like I would say the Switch, the PlayStation, all of those by Microsoft and Phil Spencer themselves, but it does appear that Microsoft cut some sort of deal with Sega and managed to get it over to Western audiences somehow. Yeah, I don't know. Microsoft did it. Who knows? Anyway, when I did get a chance to finally jump in, I was really excited. Now, it is going to be kind of overwhelming, and it was for me a little bit because this came out in 2012, so there are technically eight years worth of patches and updates and new content that's added, and we're all just being thrown in. We haven't had a chance to really grow with this game since it started. So, to see all of the stuff, there is a lot of stuff, by the way, going on in here. It was kind of hard to absorb all of it in the five to six hours I was able to play while the servers were kind of off and on at the time, and they were kind of all over the place. They gave us a little extra time, and I think I managed to get my level to about 26 or 27 before uh, I finished up for the weekend. But from what I gathered, it is a very fun action-based MMORPG, and it's Fantasy Star. So if you've played Fantasy Star on like the original Xbox, or even on like the GameCube, or maybe you were someone who played it on the Dreamcast, or even PC at this point, you know what to expect with Fantasy Star Online 2. So you start on your ship, and then from your ship you go on different expeditions, and you leave and go to settings like a forest, or a volcano, uh, or they even had like an underground kind of like ice passage. There were a lot of really cool areas to go to, and it is an MMORPG from 2012, so visually it's not like super impressive. I was playing on the Xbox One X and they gave us a 4K option and you kind of had to play around with even the text and the menus because it was kind of shrunken down. I feel like it was basically the PC version that they mostly just moved over with settings intact because there were a lot of settings you could also kind of play around with. Uh, but when I was playing through it, I, the part that caught me off guard that was really neat and I liked was the idea of the combat system not being just mashing an attack button over and over and over again. You time it out. So you, you do an attack and then you'll see kind of a, a circle start to close and then you want to press the button at the right time from there and you'll do bonus damage. And it's almost like a bit of a rhythm game when you start doing that. And you, of course, get other attacks that you can work into it. Like I was, uh, I was actually playing through and had the ability to shoot arrows into the air. I believe I was a braver class. I could shoot arrows into the air and they would kind of rain down and if I worked that into a combo, it did more damage and would just destroy everything in front of me. It was pretty neat to see, and then I did see some people kind of running around who had been obviously uh, binging the game like crazy, and they had some awesome looking weapons, uh, animals, mounts, creatures. It, it looked like there was a lot of really cool stuff to eventually earn in the game, and I did enjoy the combat. The combat was pretty fun. Now, the leveling is traditional. You gain experience, your number goes up next to your character and your name, 
like usual, like I said, I got to like 26 or 27, but there are also skill points that you get that you have a full skill tree. You can work out how you want to build your character, whether it's ranged or melee or even through, I guess, magic. And then you also have the ability to augment and change stats on your weapon. And that was just the stuff I was able to see in like the first, like five or six hours. They also have little, uh, little devices called mags that will follow you around. It seemed like there was a lot of stuff to this game. So when we do continue with it, maybe they'll do another closed beta, something coming up, or maybe they'll just do a full on release. I'll be going back to it and checking it out. I actually found myself wanting to play it again a few days later. And then I, of course I realized that even if I pressed it on the menu for my Xbox, it wouldn't find a server because it was closed down. So yes, I, I was still feeling like I wanted to go back and play more. And that is a good thing. Next, we're going to move over to a smaller indie game that came out at the end of January, January 31st on the Switch. It's actually out on Steam and that's Hypercharge unboxed and you know what I wasn't expecting a ton with this game but I did like the way it looked when I saw it on the eShop and they had actually talked to me the studio that created Digital Cyber Cherries had talked to me about this game and I said you know what? I'll check this out because I am curious about more first-person shooters on the switch as there are not as many first-person shooters on the switch as on other platforms so yeah I'm interested in checking one out, especially one that was built around customization, some tower defense, and even full PvP. When I heard PvP, I was very interested because I do like shooters like, like Halo, for example, where you go up against other people. And this is very similar, but it's also pretty different in some aspects. Now, I did try the tower defense stuff, not a huge fan of doing that. It wasn't something that's really ever appealed to me in any game. So I jumped in the PVP and you know what? I liked some of the ideas here. There are a few things I want them to really work on. The one part that I would like to see them work on is the overall game speed. It kind of feels like you're underwater at times when you're playing. So maybe if they can kind of uh, I, the response time, just the overall s speed of the game, I think needs to be uh, increased a bit. But I do like the idea of you getting your gun in the beginning, and as you're running around, you get attachments for it that are just laying around on the ground. So you go and you pick up maybe a scope that makes your aiming a bit better. You pick up maybe uh, something to actually stabilize the gun so it's not all over the place. But you can also pick up shotgun attachments, minigun attachments. I had a flamethrower at one point, and I did run around fighting other people. As you win matches or, or lose them, or basically participate, you'll get experience, and you also get the ability to unlock what looked to be a ton of stuff. So there is a lot of stuff to really earn in this game, which is cool, and of course, there's no microtransactions. They're an indie studio. They didn't want to drop that stuff in there, even though they clearly could if they wanted to. But I was hoping more people would check this one out because it looks like, when I'm playing anyway, it does at times have a hard time finding people through matchmaking. So hopefully more people check this one out. And you've probably seen some of the gameplay and yes, it, uh, it is kind of like a uh, army men, Sarge's heroes are like small soldier setting where you are basically an action figure running around in a house setting and you're all small and there's obviously a bunch of very large things around you like brooms and crates and mops and, and there's even like a full kitchen level. There's some fun stuff uh, and I like the idea of that setting in this game, but I'm going to play more of it. But so far, I think they have something here, and it looks like they're going to continue working on it with a ton of updates and even a roadmap to look forward to. Okay, so I did also play Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5, and you're probably wondering why. Well, I started to kind of get back into the older skateboarding games recently. One thing I left off of uh, this list of the different games that I played, I didn't really include any of the really old games. I'm talking like, we're going back to obviously GameCube and stuff. I've been playing my GameCube quite a bit. I could have done an entire video, and maybe I will, on some of my favorite GameCube games that I've played in 2020 from start to finish, uh, with one of them actually being Tony Hawk's uh, Underground. I, I actually really enjoyed that game. I played all the way back through it, and that led me to Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5. And it, it, it is a shame because this game, oh man, you can tell, I think that this game was just shoved out the door based on it not feeling that much different than Tony Hawk Pro Skater games from like 20 years ago. In fact, it feels worse, which is weird. Now, visually, when you look at it, it doesn't look very good for me playing it on a PlayStation 4 Pro. I feel like some of that has to do with it being a cross-generation game. So it was also on the uh, Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3, but like the character models are this weird cell shading cartoony look to them. Whereas if I play something like Skate 3, which is still my favorite skateboarding game right now to play on the Xbox One, I play it all the time. It is a massive contrast between them, and that was a 360 game. So yeah, it's I'm, I don't really get why 
Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5 looks the way it does outside of maybe the budget they were going for. Now, they were also pushing towards it being more of a live service game, and I do not like that. You can't pause the game. When you press it, a menu just comes up and everything's still moving on screen. And you go through these levels and you find challenges. Now, the challenges are just spread out or you just pick it in the menu. So I don't even know why you would skate over to them when you can just do that and teleport to them. And they're pretty straightforward. You have combos where you try to collect the letters in order. You can do skate. You can do uh, things where you'll get these balls in like uh, a bowl and you try to knock them all out. And of course, high score trick challenges. It's pretty basic. Like, I didn't really feel like there was any real innovation here, and I felt very, very much just like a cash-in on the name. Unfortunately, I just didn't see it with this game. I, I get why it has the bad reviews that it does. You know what? I will say, though, I don't think it is the worst game I've ever played, so there's that. But, man, when I first started it up and they had the stomp for the grind that is the worst thing i've ever seen turn it off immediately basically when you go to skate up to a rail and you know you you would jump and you would press uh playing on the playstation triangle you would then just start grinding on the rail it's what we've always had right back to the ps1 days well in this you jump and you press triangle and you stomp down so you just put all your weight and you just crash into the ground and a lot of times you'll just come up short and just hit the rail you just run into it so you can turn that off in the options no clue what that was about i, I don't get that one uh but yeah turn it off immediately i also don't like that l1 activates your special it's it's a weird button to have. I guess they, I, I'm trying to think of what other button they could have done. Maybe you click in like L3 or R3 or something, or you just have it normally where when your special meter is full, you then start your special. They, I think they wanted to try to make it so it was a bit more controlled and you had the option to turn on your special when you wanted it to be turned on. But I've never had an issue with the older games where when it's full, you go and you start doing specials. But once I did that, it would all of a sudden turn into kind of a different uh, different set of moves and you'd be all over the place. I did like, the one thing I liked though, uh, was the guest character in this game or characters is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and you can change between them. I like that. Oh, that was fun. Uh, they have a few other characters as well, like Tyler, the creator. All right, that was my favorite skater back in the day. Uh, but the, the, the Ninja Turtles, that was a fun addition. That's the one thing I like that Tony Hawk Pro Skater games have kept throughout is that they have have some fun guest characters whether it's like Darth Maul or Spider-Man it's always been pretty fun next up we have Darksiders Genesis uh, I had played this uh, I bought it back in December when it came out on Steam not on Stadia on Steam <laughs> it was actually like $13 cheaper on Steam than it was on Stadia weird right yeah anyway uh I did pick it up there and then I also after I played through it there I wanted to grab it on the Switch just to check it out and see how it plays because these games that go to the Switch are still really interesting to me. Like, I've played through the Metro games, and I'm still curious how that's going to look on the Switch in person, so I'll probably pick it up there. But I wanted to grab it on the Switch, and after checking it out on PC, which, to be fair to the Switch, on PC I was playing 1440p at uh, between 130 and 144 frames per second, you know, depending on what's happening with G-Sync, so... Going from that to any of these systems would have been rough, but the Switch version does seem to struggle from performance issues, and it is odd because the game doesn't look graphically impressive, I think, at least that to me anyway. Like, it doesn't look like it would be overpowering. I kind of compare it a bit to Diablo 3 on the Switch, and that runs pretty well, but I still liked Darksiders Genesis. It is a, a story for war and strife as they kind of, uh, I'll say, go through a, a certain uh, set of events, we'll say. So don't ruin it for anyone. But I liked the idea of strife finally being brought into the Darksiders universe to where we play as him. And I hope we get a Darksiders game just for him. We've had, of course, Darksiders 3, 2, and, and 1 now with, uh, we've had... Fury, Death, and War, and I think at this point I'm ready for Strife to be added in in Darksiders 4, and hopefully that's the plan here now going forward, but Strife was basically added in as their own Deadpool. Yeah, the, he's kind of the snarky, make fun of everything, have a good time uh, character here, and he's a good foil to War. War is very serious, and here, here's... um. Here's Strife always taking things lightly and having a good time with a lot of it. But I did like him as a character in the game. I like the controls where he he's more of the ranged. War is more of the melee character. It's like a top-down Diablo-style game. And you go through, you get souls, you buy new abilities. You do have puzzles similar to Darksiders. And it was a fun mix, I think, of the Darksiders formula we've seen in the past three games with something like a Diablo, and it was pretty good. It was a little, little longer than I thought it would be as well, about 12 to somewhere between 12 and 15 hours, depending on 
the difficulty you may have with some parts, or if you're someone who likes to explore a lot, there is a lot of stuff to find here. And I think if you wanted 100% this game, you might get closer to 30 hours because there is a lot of stuff to do in it, even after you beat the overall game. The part that I didn't really like too much about it is you, while you have your uh, own abilities that you buy and equip, you also have like these creature spheres that you collect. And I wasn't a big fan of the way they set that up. They have like this grid that you drop them down in and you try to link them and then you have more powerful ones on top of that as well. And my my big issue with, with this is you also have to collect more of them. So even if you just have one, maybe you need to get 10 of them to max it out. So you end up just basically running through the level over and over again, trying to get that certain creature sphere. Now, sometimes by the end of the game, you'll already have some maxed out, but you might need to max out others to try to complete a certain build that you want. And it ends up just being fairly tedious. I think I would have preferred just a standard skill tree that has passive abilities that you go through and make it much more streamlined, but I guess they wanted to have kind of their own sphere grid almost from like a Final Fantasy X, sort of, and you just place these spheres. It's almost like they just, to me anyway, they overthought what they could have just done here, which would have been an easy passive uh, skill system that you put points into to get more health, more uh, more attack, more defense, things like that. And the last game that I did get a chance to play through and have some fun with was Temtem. Now, Temtem admittedly is not a game you're going to finish now because they're about halfway done it, but playing through a good bit of it up past the first dojo is it's actually been pretty fun. And that's really funny coming from me, considering I've grown fairly bored of Pokemon in general now. I think people can still enjoy Pokemon, and I think that's really cool that people do, but after being around Pokemon as long as I have now, it's it just doesn't feel like it's changed a ton, or it's been kind of moved back to being a bit easier as we've gone along and I get the audience for it is as they said try to be for everyone whether it's younger kids or an older audience they try to make it so that everyone can pick up and play Pokemon and I think that's perfectly fine but it does feel to me anyway kind of stagnant at this point and maybe they'll work towards that and do some different things in the future but Temtem is like Pokemon but uh but I guess brought into the new generation kind of. It's an always online MMORPG. That might immediately turn some people off. However, that's kind of how they've always marketed the thing, so I kind of expect that going in. And that opens up some pretty cool things where you and a friend can run through the entire game together. They do 2v2 battles pretty much exclusively throughout, minus the beginning where I had to fight against your rival who just wiped you out, by the way. It wasn't an easy thing. They just they just take you out. They smack you down immediately, uh, which, was, which was an interesting thought there. Uh, the gameplay itself is pretty cool because you have a stamina system and instead of having basic MP, the stamina system will refill every battle. But as you use moves that might take a turn or two to charge that you can't use the first turn and try to wipe someone out, you will lose that stamina and you can get to a point where you're just completely out of it. And then you have to decide if you want to try to roll the dice, hurt yourself and over exhaust your Temtem uh, into the next turn, possibly to do the last blow to the enemy or wait and try to recharge some of your stamina. It's it's an interesting wrinkle kind of thrown in there for strategy, and that's something I've been looking for Pokemon to try to do, is change things up a little bit with the battle system, but still keep it fairly normal and regular how they've had it now, more traditional, and Temtem seem to have done that. Now, Temtem's also more difficult. Like, you may have a, a Temtem who's level 23 and you're going up against an enemy who's like level 16 or 17, and they'll still be able to do some damage to you. Good damage even, like actually take, start actually knocking your Temtem out, which is weird, but it all comes down to the strategy. They don't have it so that when you out level an enemy by like eight or nine levels, that it's an easy win and you know, there's no way they can take you down. No, they can still knock you out in a couple of moves. You have to be fairly careful with it, but of course, you can still blow them away if you do things right. I think visually it looks pretty good so far. Now, of course, again, this is on PC. I'll be curious to see how it looks on consoles, which I believe is happening next year. They're gonna move it over to the Switch, the PS4, and the Xbox One. We'll see with the PS5 and the Series X, although I guess if it's if they're just backwards compatible with whatever gets moved over, it should be there as well. But visually, I think it looks pretty good, runs fine on PC. It doesn't need much to run either, so most computers will be able to play it. My one real issue with Temtem right now, beyond the idea of it not being completed, although they're selling it in early access, so they've kind of told you it's not completed, is I don't really feel 
I don't really feel any type of attachment or I don't really remember the Temtem that well. And I don't think it has to do with the designs. I just think because it's so new, I, like there's no there's no Pikachu, right? There's no Charizard. There's no no Temtem. You just slap on the front cover and you're like, I know that creature immediately. They don't have that marketing presence yet like Pokemon does, and it could take time to build up, but I think that is the biggest hurdle they have in front of them is to come up with their own mascot that is as memorable, or even even like a tenth as memorable as Pikachu, then they have something there, but until that point, they're always going to be in the shadow of Pokemon, even if they have better gameplay mechanics and just an overall better game even, I would say. And those are my five games so far, best and worst. The best so far that I would say that I, that I played so far in 2020, I'm not counting Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, did a whole video on that one, but from this list, best game I've played so far in 2020 isn't even like the full game, it's Fantasy Star Online 2. I had a blast with that one. Worst game so far of the year that I've played is Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5. That feels like a waste of $15. By the way, it was on sale for $15 from $60. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, but let me know what you guys think about the list here. And let me know which games you guys have been playing in 2020. Because I know, I know, it's been a boring year so far. Right? Last year we had RE2. We had Kingdom Hearts. We had DMC5. This year we had Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Yeah. And, and Fantasy Star Online 2 beta. So, you know, something. Uh, but let me know, guys, which games you've been playing so far this year. Which one's your favorite games? Which one was a waste of money like I did with Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5? Thanks, guys, for watching, and I'll see you next time.